Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Today, we're talking with Kathleen McAuliffe. She is the author of the book, This is Your Brain on Parasites, How Tiny Creatures Manipulate Our Behavior and Shape Society. This book um, is the bestseller in parasitology and microbiology and has been translated into six languages. Kathleen, welcome to the show. A pleasure to be with you. So what inspired you to put this book together? Good question. Uh, one day while foraging for ideas to uh, write about, I uh, came across an article about a one-celled uh, microbe that invades the brains of rodents and tinkers with their neural circuits in the process, turning their innate fear of cats into an attraction, and by attraction, I mean sexual attraction. The infected rodents uh, are, are drawn to cats and soon end up in their bellies, needless to say, and uh, this turns out to be not only convenient for the cat, but also, to my astonishment, uh, f- for the parasite. Uh, because the cat gut is the only place where this parasite can replicate. Uh, This just struck me as the most astonishing thing I'd ever heard, so I knew right away I had to find out more about it. Uh, and, And I soon discovered that this whole phenomenon called parasitic manipulation is actually... Uh, far more common in nature uh, than wide, widely appreciated, uh, even even by some scientists. Well, you know, I definitely agree with you. Um, I, parasites are are something that I, I treat a lot with my patients. And um, in reading your book, I learned um, way more than I think I wanted to know. Uh, I mean, some of the stories, just like the one you told, remind me of you know Star Trek, um, the old movies where you know the the little parasite controls them, and and the the parasites running the show. Um, and, and you have several stories like that in your book um you know the it which is baffling that we don't talk about this more <laughs> i know as i say it's not uh it's not that um widely appreciated uh but uh, i think these par- parasites play a huge role uh in nature in fact uh you know we wide we often think of predators as you know having this supreme hunting prowess but in many cases um it may be um you know, they're going after low-hanging fruit brought within their reach, uh, courtesy of parasites. Which is crazy. You, you have a story in your book about um, a parasite that um, infects ants. And um, could you just tell us about that one? That's a wild one. Um, that yeah. um, that uh, parasite... Um, actually uh, invades the, um, the, the brain of the ant uh, and a part of the brain that um, controls locomotion and also the mouth parts of the ant. And um, the reason it does this is because um, the, the ant has to get into a sheep to complete its life cycle. It can only reproduce in the bile duct of a sheep. And uh, ants are not on a sheep's normal menu. So the parasite has a major challenge, which is how is it going to get from the ant into the sheep? So by invading the ant's brain and altering its locomotion and mouth parts, what it does is it triggers the infected ant uh, to leave its colony at night and climb a blade of grass to the very tip and then latch onto it. And there it will remain um, all night long 
um, if it isn't eaten by a grazing sheep, uh, it will then return to its colony during the day. It does this because this is wild. You know, if it were to remain on the blade of grass, it would, you know, fry to death in the noonday sun. So it goes up and down night after night until some unsuspecting sheep happens to swallow the ant and the parasite can get back into uh, the, 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 um, the sheep's bile duct. Well, it, it, this is really crazy that somehow the parasite, you know, these tiny little creatures know enough that it needs to get into the sheep and that it needs to manipulate the ant to get there. Like, like that, that's just crazy to me that, that it has that intelligence. Nature is wild, and um, in many cases, biologists themselves don't understand how these relationships, uh, you know, what the evolutionary history is that uh, led to these sort of complex life cycles of parasites, especially since, you know, why would they choose, you know, two hosts that normally don't associate with each other? Yeah, they don't associate with each other, and then... um it, to to get into the sheep, uh, it, like like I'm just finding this really fascinating, and I'm sure that we don't understand enough of this, as you're saying, but but um, it 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 definitely gives me the chills <laughs> to think about this story, <laughs> and I'm sure anyone else listening as well. Um, you know, we um, anytime I talk about parasites with my patients, they get the heebie-jeebies, and and they're kind of freaked out about it. But you know, they they must be more common than than we give them credit for. Yes, and, and many, um, well, actually, I should say that there are about a hundred or so that are really well documented in the scientific literature, but there are a few hundred um, where there's quite strong evidence that uh, they, these parasites probably are manipulators, and most experts in the field assume that there's thousands of them. And the ones that we do know about often infect keystone species uh, and are extremely uh, common in nature. Uh, the cat parasite that I just mentioned, Toxoplasma gondii, um, can also infect humans. In fact, um, about 30% of people have the parasite in their brains. Um, and in the vast majority of cases, the parasite remains dormant. Um, it's familiar just to some um, people because pregnant women are told to avoid changing cat litter boxes. Um, and that's because if a woman is exposed to the parasite during pregnancy, it can damage the nervous system of the fetus or damage the eyes, causing blindness, um, or trigger a miscarriage if a baby, uh, infected baby is born. Uh, can be mentally incapa- incapacitated or, or, or blind. Um, so that's one reason it's known about. Um, another reason is that if you're exposed to the parasite and you're immunocompromised, so for example, if you're being treated with chemotherapy for cancer or you have HIV, um, the parasite can also um, cause um, severe neurological damage or, or even um, cause a fatal infection, fatal inflammation of the brain. But the medical profession for the longest time assumed that if you're healthy, it causes absolutely no problem, that after the parasite invades brain cells, that it just sort of hunkers down, uh, becomes a dormant infection, never again to cause any problems uh, for, throughout a person's life. Uh, but one of um, the, the newest findings in the field is that um, for some percentage of people with the dormant uh, infection, and nobody knows how many, it may be quietly causing uh, a number of problems. Um, for example, um, there's research by a Czech scientist named Yaroslav Flager, uh, and um, he strongly believes that the parasite causes changes in personality, um, different ones depending on your gender. Uh, his research suggests that infected men become more antisocial, more withdrawn, and uh, they tend to be kind of rule breakers, uh, reserved, 
and women, on the other hand, tend to be more conscientious and sort of warmer and more outgoing. Um, his theory being that when um, men are under stress, there there's a large psychological literature that shows that they tend to withdraw more, whereas women who are stressed uh, cope by tending and befriending. So that's his theory. Um, that research is very uh, controversial, and not all studies have reproduced it. Uh, however, a, a large body of research shows that people who are infected tend to have slower reaction times, and they um, possibly for that reason, or perhaps because they're less risk-prone, uh, or more risk-prone, um, less fearful, um, they are more prone to being in car accidents. And studies in several different countries show that people who are infected are about um, two to three times more likely to be in car crashes. There's also a large literature that has linked the parasite to um, schizophrenia. In fact, you know, almost all large overview studies have shown that if you have schizophrenia, you're two to three times more likely to um, test positive for um, antibodies against the parasite. It's also been linked to suicide. So there's growing concern that in a, in a small percentage of people with a dormant infection, it may be causing um, a lot of uh, problems. Uh, well, it definitely sounds like it. I mean, these are, are things to be of concern. Now, we only talk about this as a concern if you're pregnant, as you mentioned. Um, and if you have a cat, you're not told anything to be concerned about unless you are pregnant, um, which now you're saying that perhaps there there is something to be concerned about. Yes, and it's not just if you have a cat because um, people can be exposed not just um, as a result of changing a litter box. Um, the, the, when the cats, uh, when the parasite re- reproduces inside cats, um, they, they shed the parasite's eggs and their feces. So um, it's not, uh, so if, you're, if you garden uh, and you don't wash your hands thoroughly afterwards, you can be exposed, or if you harvest vegetables from your garden, and you don't, you know, scrub them perfectly clean of all dirt particles, you can be exposed that way. And another surprising route, and perhaps very common route by which people are exposed, is by eating rare beef and lamb. And the reason for that is that grazing cattle, just like grazing ro- uh, foraging rodents can pick up the parasite from the ground, so too can grazing cattle. And the parasite not only goes to their brain, but it can actually... Um, form cysts in their muscles, which is the meat that we eat. So uh, I mentioned before that about 30% of people around the world test positive for the parasite. Well, in places where people like their meat really rare, for example, in France, um, 50% of people are infected. Um, th- those, are, those are crazy numbers. Now, um, hearing this, should people just go in and get rid of their cats, or is there something that they can do? Um, I would not. I'm a, I'm a cat lover. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I would not recommend that because I think cats are also so important um, in many instances for, um, you know, psychological well-being, especially when people live alone and so on. I think that they probably confirm any more mental benefits than than cause harm. Um, As I say, it's assumed that it's only a a tiny percent of people um, who are infected. And and recall that a lot of people get it not by being a cat owner, but, you know, by eating rare meat. Another way I should have mentioned is that um, a favorite place for cats to bury their feces is in sandboxes. So um, sandboxes should always be covered when they're not in use. Um, so I think a much better strategy than not having cats as pets is to, to take precautions like that, cover sandboxes. If you like rare meat, um, freeze it first because that um, kills parasites. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, be careful about good hygiene, washing your hands very thoroughly after changing a litter box, after gardening, after, you know, when you're washing vegetables, scrub them thoroughly. Uh, so I think it makes much more sense to take precautions of that sort. 
Well, yeah, definitely. If you're saying we can get it from other places, we might as well just be more careful rather than giving up all the cats in the world. Um, you, you know, especially. Also, um, I should have yeah. mentioned that cats can only um, they can only produce the eggs once. So once they become infected, um, they they then shed the eggs, and um, it. It takes quite a long time for the eggs to actually hatch. So if you clean counters, you know, just, you know, you don't have to do it every 20 minutes mm-hmm. or even daily, but if you just do it, you know, fairly regularly, you're, you're really um, able to protect against um, infection. Mm. I think that's really important. Uh, We're going to take a quick break. We'll be uh, back shortly. We're talking today with Kathleen McAuliffe, and we're discussing her book, This Is Your Brain on Parasites. We'll be back. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. When a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, it's probably the most frightening thing that's ever happened to her. Friends and family often don't know what to do for support, not to mention the patient herself. That's where Breast Friends Cancer Support Radio comes in. Join Becky Olson and Sharon Hennepin breast cancer survivors and advocates they help by providing inspiration information and most of all hope tune in wednesdays at 9 a.m pacific time 12 noon eastern time on the voice america health and wellness channel and thursdays at 9 a.m pacific time on the voice america women's channel Healthcare has been a major part of news stories today with one thing that has been consistent inconsistency. Both healthcare providers and patients have to work around and get used to a constantly changing set of rules and issues. Nurses have historically been left out of this decision making. Listen to Once a Nurse, Always a Nurse, exploring the world of nursing with host Leanne Meyer. Health professionals, we invite you to share your ideas and experiences while listening to experts in various areas of nursing. Listen Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern. 10 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. 
A stain-free and clean home is something to be proud about, but it's hard to maintain when you're using cleaning products that don't work well or take forever to use. Q Carbona, a household brand that has turned their decades of cleaning expertise into products that get the job done fully, quickly, and easily. When I heard about Stain Devils, my stain-removing game was changed. Think about this. If you have a chocolate stain, it wouldn't make sense to treat it with a formula that removes wine because they're chemically different. Knowing this, Carbona created specific stain removers for specific stain types. Genius, right? Beyond stain removers, they have highly efficient products for your laundry, carpets, and washing machine. My co-host Oliver, who is a Chihuahua cross and sits with me through all my shows, wants to remind you not to forget about the, the pet stain and odor remover. Want to start living your life unstained? Shop Carbona.com with code FTTC for 20% off your order. So Kathleen, you're you use the book um, parasitic manipulators. Sorry, the 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 phrase in your book, and and this isn't something that that is a household name. Although, after reading your book, I think it should be. Can you just talk about that a little bit more? Sure. And also, what I wanted to do is um, define a parasite. Um, with a little more specificity, since sometimes even um, scientists uh, use the term in slightly different ways. So to most laymen, a parasite is um, lice or ticks or mites uh, or tapeworms or other parasitic worms. And um, indeed, that they those do constitute a large uh, group of, of parasitic organisms, organisms that can't live independently of their host. But also um, microbes, many microbes are parasites as well. Um, so if all viruses are parasites, they can't replicate independent of a host. And many parasitic bacteria uh, are parasites uh, and many other types of um, microbes. And um, it's, it's long been known, of course, that parasites can cause any variety of um, illnesses, but um, it's only been appreciated for the last few decades that some parasites um, have a unique ability. They are masters of mind control, if you will. They can manipulate the behavior of their host to enhance their own transmission at a cost to the host. So I've given a few examples already, but um, let me uh, t- tell you one or two more, um, some of my um, favorites. Uh, one is a flatworm that invades the um, brains of killifish, which are very common fish. It's only a few inches long, found in many freshwater uh, estuaries in California and, and other parts of the world. And when this um, this brain, sorry, this this worm, in, it invades the, it, it enters via the gills of the fish and then um, follows nerve tracks to the brain. And once it gets there, it begins um, pumping out chemicals that act on the same neural circuits as Prozac. So infected fish um, are kind of like fish on Prozac. So they're um, much um, less anxious than normal fish. So normally a killifish will stay um, far beneath the surface of the ocean um, because they want to avoid predators. However, like the, uh, the, their shorebirds often uh, like to swoop down and kill killifish. But these uh, fish, these infected fish, these fish on Prozac rise to the surface, flip over on their bellies, exposing their white undersides, and all but wave their fins at the shorebirds, which then, you know, fly down and pick them out of the water. And, in fact, the majority of killifish uh, are, um, that are, are predated are ones that are infected. So more than 90% of uh, killifish eaten by shorebirds uh, have this parasitic worm. And this is a keystone species in uh, California. And this is one of, at least in California uh, estuaries, it's... It, one of the most populist fish uh, there are. 
And um, so, and this parasite is basically acting like a conveyor belt, moving this vast amount of food from the ocean to the air and back down again in this endless cycle. So there's just one example. Another is, uh, and this is one of my very favorites, <laughs> is um, a barnacle called uh, Saculina. Suspend any preconceived notions you have about barnacles because this one does not have a shell, nor does it attach to seaweed or the sides of piers. It, um, during its free-living stage, it uh, swims around in the ocean until following scent, it alights on a crab and injects a clump of its cells into the crab. And these cells then form um, a dense fibrous bundle that wraps around the brain of the crab and all of its internal organs, kind of like a metastatic cancer. And then um, it eventually will castrate or neuter the crab. And where female crabs would grow a brood pouch to harbor their young on their underbelly, it pushes out and it grows um, a brood pouch of its own. And from that moment forward, the crab basically is, exists solely to feed and nurture the parasite's young. And um, when they're ready to be born, it will then go out into deep water, bob up and down, and um, with its claws, it will sort of beat the water to send them on their way so that they can, you know, command the, the, the minds and bodies of more crabs. And these crabs are, you know, when I first heard, heard about this, I thought, oh, this is, you know, totally, you know, bizarre, but it's obviously a novelty and, you know, there surely aren't many crabs out there in nature uh, like this. I mean, basically, um, barnacles masquerading as crabs. But in fact, um, uh, these, what I call them robo-crabs, they are constitute a huge proportion of crabs. So, for example, in Hawaii, 50% of crabs are robo-crabs. And in the Chesapeake Bay, off of Maryland, about 70% are robo-crabs. And there are parts of the Mediterranean in which 100% of crabs, um, sometime over the course of their life, will become infected. Um, so the, you know, hearing those kind of stats, I'm just wondering how um, parasites are also affecting humans. If if it's 50 percent of these crabs and 50, you know, most of those fish, um, are are we also being inf- infected by parasites and not realizing that this is happening? This is a big question. We don't. Uh, no, the answer to, I mean, there's clearly a ton of parasites that we know cause illness and sometimes um, even um, neurological illness, but whether they might be manipulating our behavior in more subtle ways um, is, is something that is a um, really hot topic at the moment and um, being more... Uh, intensively uh, and being intensively researched uh, at the moment. So there's concern that uh, a number of of parasites may be very quietly unbeknownst to us uh, causing a variety of problems. There's certainly ones like rabies that we've known about uh, for for centuries. Um, Well, rabies, by the way, sorry, well, there's a topic that's, that's not in your book, and uh, so I have um, uh, I have a history of, of chronic Lyme for myself, and I did an interview with uh, Mary Beth Pfeiffer last year and um, about, about her book, and she did a lot of research on Lyme, and what she talked about, and this is just coming into my head because of all your stories about parasitic manipulators, is that ticks that are um, more common, that are infected with the bacteria are more commonly likely to bite you than an uninfected tick. So, so, and I didn't understand it at the time, but now knowing everything that we're talking about today, this is part of the the um, the parasite, the infection 
um, trying to get into where it wants to be, which is not a tick, because <laughs> it doesn't infect the tick. Um, so, so, um, and you know, we know this is an emerging disease, and I know it's not a topic of your book, but, but I think that there's there's more that we don't understand for sure going on out there um, that that's happening to us. Yes, for example, um, what you were just saying about ticks uh, made me think about um, the protozoan that causes malaria. There is um, increasing evidence, for example, that um, once somebody becomes infected with um, the parasite, that it changes um, their odor so that um, mosquitoes that have yet to be infected are more attracted to those people. They bite them, and now they're like flying syringes, and they carry the infected blood to many more people, in this way increasing um, the spread of the infection. Um, Also, once a a mosquito becomes infected, it invades its... um, It's salivary glands, and there's some evidence that it initially, um, early on, they uh, infected mosquitoes, have more difficulty feeding, and so they become ravenously hungry. And early on, the the, um, parasite is not yet at the infectious stage, but as it continues developing, it does become infectious, and at just that point, the insects suddenly are able to feed again, and they start feeding profusely. Um, so again, they become much more effective vectors of malaria, um, which we know is an issue. This is um, I, I just find this really fascinating that that you know this infection will change the way that we smell to a to a bug, and and, and then it will yeah. I, I, it's uh, pretty crazy, and and that we don't understand enough because I know. Um, you know, if you talk to a doctor in in Canada and probably throughout North America, um, and you talk about parasites, I know that th- there's not much that happens in that conversation with them. There's there's not much knowledge and there's not much training, um, and and uh, most likely from what you said, we just don't really know what's going on. Yes, there are many of uh, parasites that are um, suspected of being manipulators or on the list of um, least, um, uh, CDC has a list of ignored parasitic infections, and Toxoplasma is one of them. They're, they're on this list of ignored infections, ones that have not been researched anywhere near enough relative to the um, number of people that they infect and their, their health toll. Well, is there a way to test for toxoplasma if it's gone up into your brain and is just, you know, benignly sitting there? That's the problem. Um, we can, yes, there's a test, a blood test, a simple blood test that can tell you whether or not you've been infected and you know, if you have antibodies against the parasite. Um, and if you do, that, that does imply that um, the parasite's in, in your brain because that's where the parasite migrates. But... As I say, the vast majority of people have absolutely no symptoms that we know of and uh, are are unharmed for their entire life. It's a dormant infection. So what we don't know is what percentage of people um, who appear to have a dormant infection really are being uh, quietly harmed by the parasite. There we, we just don't have answers yet. Um, which I I hope that we get <laughs> quickly, um, but but you know science is slow, so I'm sure that it'll come around. Um, we're we're gonna take a quick break. Um, we're talking today with Kathleen McAuliffe, and we're we're discussing her book. This is your brain on parasites: how tiny creatures manipulate our behavior and shape society. And we'll be back shortly. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. 
When a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, it's probably the most frightening thing that's ever happened to her. Friends and family often don't know what to do for support, not to mention the patient herself. That's where Breast Friends Cancer Support Radio comes in. Join Becky Olson and Sharon Hennepin, breast cancer survivors and advocates. They help by providing inspiration, information, and most of all, hope. Tune in Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific Time, 12 noon Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel and Thursdays at 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Women's Channel. Healthcare has been a major part of news stories today with one thing that has been consistent, inconsistency. Both healthcare providers and patients have to work around and get used to a constantly changing set of rules and issues. Nurses have historically been left out of this decision making. Listen to Once a Nurse, Always a Nurse, exploring the world of nursing with host Leanne Meyer. Health professionals, we invite you to share your ideas and experiences while listening to experts in various areas of nursing. Listen Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Riss. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Riss. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Kathleen McAuliffe. So, Kathleen, I know that I'm going to be asked a little more about um, the schizophrenia comment um, that that we we touched on it briefly. And I just want you to talk about a little more if we understand um, that is the the link between toxoplasma and schizophrenia you said they're more likely to test positive for the parasite and um, is there more understanding about that at this point well one study um, found that um, only a certain percentage well it's been known let me backtrack for a second it's been known for some time uh, that people with schizophrenia often overproduce the neurotransmitter dopamine, so they have excess dopamine in their brains. It's also been known for some time that uh, some percentage of schizophrenia patients um, have less gray matter in certain parts of their brains. And one MRI study found that the schizophrenia patients who lacked gray matter were the only ones that tested positive for the parasite. So that would imply, I mean, if that, it's a controversial study and I, I'm hoping it will be confirmed by others, but, but if it's correct, then that would imply that uh, certainly not all cases of schizophrenia are caused by the parasite, but some subset probably are. Uh, and there's also um, evidence that schizophrenia 
is um, genetic in the sense that it tends to run in certain families, so it's it's more uh, you're more at greater risk of developing schizophrenia um, if it runs in your family. So clearly, some cases may be genetic in their uh, origin. However, even that's a little bit murky because some of the genetic evidence suggests that what seems to be inherited is um, the, the genes that are involved in schizophrenia are involved in the functioning of the immune system. So it could also be that what's being passed down is a susceptibility to toxoplasma. Oh, that's interesting. So it's very complicated. Yeah. Well, and it definitely is complicated. I, you know, I've talked about schizophrenia on the show before and, and um, sometimes there seems to be simple conversations about it. And I don't think it, it is that simple um, or we would have, have a cure for it. You know, everybody would be tested for toxoplasma and treated and we would continue on with life. And I don't think it, it is that easy. Yes. I mean, my own suspicion is that it's, uh, only a small percentage of um, cases of schizophrenia that are, are directly linked to the parasite. Um, I've heard estimates based on a, a variety of different um, methods, uh, and I don't think any of them are very reliable, but anywhere from 5 to 30% of schizophrenia cases uh, might be attributed to the parasite. Um, so your, the title of your book is Tiny Creatures Manipulate Our Behavior. Um, are there other things, I mean, we're talking about these manipulators, but are there other things like the toxoplasma that we know that are affecting humans? Or is this just still something that we're, we're looking into more? Well, I have um, a chapter two on um our microbiome, which is to say all the bacteria that are normal residents of our body. And the reason I include them, even though technically they're not, um, at least most of them, uh, are not parasites, nonetheless, there's uh, growing evidence that these normal microbial residents of our body can uh, radically alter our behavior. So can you just tell us a little bit more about the microbiome? Sure. It's a fascinating subject. In fact, I'm currently teaching a course um, at the University of Miami um, about the microbiome. Uh, In fact, it's really one of the hottest areas in medicine today. And one of the reasons why is that these microbes make up the majority of the cells in our body. So we're about... um, about 58% uh, microbial, and um, the very first microbes to colonize our body um, after birth, um, there's mounting evidence that these microbes have a huge impact on how the entire brain wires together. Um, the, the microbes are found everywhere in the body, but they're most abundant in the gut, owing to, you know, the bountiful source of nutrients there. Uh, and they aid in digestion. They manufacture vitamins we can't synthesize. They, they kill pathogenic um, bacteria. But um, also, uh, and this is something not widely appreciated, these um, bacteria produce virtually every single neurotransmitter uh, found in the brain and every um, hormone found throughout the body and hordes of other uh, neuroactive chemicals. And uh, rodent research uh, very convincingly shows that these microbes impact behavior. So just to give you a simple example, scientists have the ability to raise rodents Um, under sterile conditions so that they have absolutely no bacteria. So a normal rodent um, is is very inquisitive, it's curious, it loves to explore, it's it's a a quick learner, it has a good memory, you know, remembers how to run mazes, Uh, and it's, of course, very um, risk-adverse, it avoids predators, but rodents of exactly um, the same strain, 
that do not have uh, any microbes, um, these uh, animals are positively bizarre. So um, they are they lack normal curiosity. They're slow to learn, quick to forget, uh, and they're not they're stunningly um, risk prone. So they don't seem to have a normal fear response. So they'll wander out into wide open spaces, bright, brightly lit areas that scream danger to the normal rodent. And they, they don't even experience distress when separated from their mothers um, at birth. Uh, and, of course, their mothers are essential for, you know, their nurturance and protection. You know, normal rodents will uh, emit no end of distress calls if separated from its mothers. So it's very clear that um, microbes have a very big impact on uh, normal uh, neurological development, and um, they are increasingly um, being shown to affect even more subtle aspects of behavior. For example, if you take these, um, if you take rodents of one uh, strain with um, rodents, by the way, with different strains have different sort of personality types. Mm -hmm. So what they'll do is they'll take a rodent with one personality type and then they will transfer its bacteria to a a sterile rodent of another um, strain with a completely different personality type. And when they do this, the recipient develops the personality of the donor strain. So you can basically do a personality swap. So if you take a sort of uh, gregarious, aggressive um, species and you transfer their bacteria to a much calmer, more peaceful species, it, uh, or strain, I should say, strain of, of rodent, uh, it will then acquire the personality of the aggressive strain. Well, I have multiple questions. Hopefully we can get to them, get to them all in, in the last 10 minutes of the show. Um, so the, a lot of people are doing fecal transplants. This has become a new thing in science. And so has that been observed that uh, personality will change as well? Or are we okay, aware fecal of Fecal transplants are primarily being used right now to um, treat um, a... Um, a condition called Clostridium difficile, C. diff for short, uh, which is chronic uh, diarrhea. It's very hard to treat, and in the elderly, it can even be um, fatal. You know, they just, uh, they can't uh, absorb calories, and they kind of wither away and eventually die. Um, It's a horrible condition. You're basically chained to a toilet. And fecal transplantation, so if you take um, feces from a normal healthy donor and using, you know, for example, a a colonoscope, what's used to um, perform a colonoscopy. If you use that to insert, you know, stool from a healthy donor into someone with this condition, you can cure them. Um, But scientists are now um, trying to use fecal transplantation to treat a variety of um, other conditions. Um, And... One uh, that I think is may surprise you is autism. Now, this is a study that was um, just published a few months ago, and I'm surprised it hasn't gotten uh, much more coverage in the press. It is a very a small study. I believe there were 28 um, patients in the study. However, the findings were very, very statistically significant. And it was um, a study, uh, these were all autistic patients, and um, what uh, the researchers did is they transferred stool from healthy people without autism uh, to the, the autistic children, and they found that uh, the, the children, um, many, not all, but many of the children, in fact, the majority uh, saw um, a decrease in symptoms. And at the start of the study, most of the, the um, subjects had severe D- 
to moderate autism, by the end of the study, the majority had moderate to mild or no autism. And uh, one of the interesting things about the study is I I assumed when I first started reading it that it involved um, mainly babies because, uh, you know, it, it... the microbes have a big influence on how the brain wires together. So I assumed if you were going to try and use fecal transplantation to treat a condition like autism, that you'd have to start out very young. They do have ways even with babies to, to detect autism, like based on what parts of the brain respond to photographs of faces and things. But at any rate, it turned out that it wasn't um, very young children that were in the study. It was children 7 to 17 so it was stunning that uh, that it had any effect from that standpoint. It was also stunning because it was a single fecal transplantation. And um, finally, the study was only, only supposed to last about two months, but most of the parents uh, told the researchers that they saw after the two months had elapsed that they thought their children were continuing to improve to show fewer symptoms of autism. So the researchers extended the study to um, two years. So the results that I'm telling you where, you know, these cases went from severe to to moderate or moderate to mild or or even very few symptoms of autism at all, this happened over two years. So it happened gradually as, as, you know, over time. Hmm. Um, I've, I've, find that fascinating and I, I have heard of of that study um, you know and I, I wonder um, now a lot of people take probiotics which is supposed to you know replenish your your microbiome and and I'm guessing we're not seeing the same results in doing that than we are in the fecal transplant uh, the, the fecal transplantation is um, very different because um, prior to fecal transplantation, um, the the recipient uh, of the transplant is it normally takes um, a v- variety of um, drugs that are given prior to colonoscopy to sort of purge the gut of uh, of its contents. So um, you, you kind of cleanse the gut as much as possible prior to the procedure, and then you are introducing an entire ecosystem. Whereas when you take probiotics, you already have a founding population of microbes that over your life have become, you know, beautifully adapted to to your um, gut. And so when you take a few microbes in a pill or even, you know, eat fermented foods or whatever... It's very hard to, um, to, to change the fundamental constitution of your microbiome, and it tends to revert back to its, you know, normal configuration. Um, you know, when you try and manipulate it, it tends to revert back to its normal configuration. And it's just because the, the founding population has, you know, a big advantage. You know, various different kinds of niches have already been filled. You know, the ones that break down, you have microbes that break down certain, you know, classes of carbohydrates and proteins and so on. And um, so for an, an outsider, another microbe to come in from outside the, uh, the body and then, um, you know, evict a, a longtime resident and take that position is, is kind of an uphill battle. Um, there is evidence that through changes in diet, you can um, make um, changes in the gut. Uh, and in particular, um, if people go from one uh, part of the world and move to another part of the world that's very different, so for, in- for instance, if you go from the United States to, a, um, uh, to the developing world, um, there was a study of Americans who moved to India, um, it can cause fairly um, radical um, shifts uh, in your microbiome, and, and that's not just related to diet, of course, but also to the water and other microbes that you're just um, exposed to in, your, um, in the daily environment uh, that are, are very different. Um, the, I um, do eat foods that I know are, are supposed to be 
very good for uh, in terms of um, being you know food for the healthy bacteria that you want. Uh, to multiply inside your gut. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know whether it's really helping, but I eat like a muesli every day, basically any kind of roughage. Um, like uh, I eat, you know, muesli has lots of different types of seeds in it and um, any kind of roughage that makes your body work hard to break down the food. Well, when I say your body works hard to break down the food, like carrots and cabbage and so forth, it's really the microbes that are working hard to break down the yeah. food. So you're feeding vast populations of bacteria. So I I do believe in, in eating foods that I know, fermented foods or another, that um, I know are really um, good for um, helping to, to feed um, the bacteria that we know to be um, uh, healthy bacteria. Um, but I'll tell you one story that will give you an idea of why I think... Um, efforts uh, in microbiome medicine are going to have to be very, very um, individualized. There was a study in, uh, done in Israel, a very well done study, um, in which the, the subjects wore portable glucose monitors round the clock and their diet was strictly controlled. It was done um, in hospital. The people were not allowed to leave. And they were, you know, fed different foods. And then um, the the researchers looked to see uh, how their bodies responded. And if you eat uh, any kind of food, you want uh, you don't want a big spike in glucose. Yes, you do need an increase in glucose to um, make the food available to the cells in your body. But you don't want a dramatic spike because that's you know, what happens in pre-diabetes and ultimately leads to diabetes. And they found with different subjects that different foods cause these spikes. And in some people, foods that we think of as very healthy, like tomatoes, or which are rich in lycopenes, well, in one man, they caused such a dramatic spike that, um, that he had to be maintained on uh, metformin. And, um, and as soon as he took, ceased eating tomatoes, he no longer needed to take the drug to control his pre-diabetic condition. Hmm. Uh, and, and other people, they found that white rice seemed to be good for them. Uh, and some people, they found ice cream was really good, and others it was really bad. I wish I knew which, person, which <laughs> right? category I fell um, into. <laughs> Um, we're going to have to to end the conversation. I'm sure you and I could talk forever on this topic, but unfortunately, we just have an hour. Um, if anybody wants more information, which I I definitely think that um, everybody should read your book, how can they um, get a hold of your book or you if they have questions? It is carried by most um, major booksellers, so Barnes and Noble. Um, and borders, assuming it's still around. My God, <laughs> bookstores aren't doing too well these days. But you can definitely yeah. get it on Amazon. Okay. So if you just type in my name or the name of the book, it will pop right up. Oh, perfect. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much for joining me today. This was a fascinating topic. It was a pleasure to be with you. Um, today we were talking with Kathleen McAuliffe and her book is This Is Your Brain on Parasites. If you want more information about my story or what I went through on my journey back to health, you can find that on my website at dr-risk.com. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram or your favorite social media platform. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week.